Hello, everyone. This is uh, JJ Risha with uh, Pismo Ventures. Let me turn off my phone so it doesn't keep ringing. Um, uh, welcome to another episode of uh, uh, live streaming from uh, Pismo Ventures. And today we have with us uh, Bruce Verga. Bruce Verga is the CEO of Title Three Funds. And I'm going to let him introduce himself in a few minutes. But first, I want to tell you a little bit of what we're doing today. Um, we're exciting. We're excited to have really Bruce today and the many uh, thought leaders and and movers and shakers in our community. Um, what we do every Monday at eleven is uh, we have an hour with uh, a, a, one of the thought leaders, one of the uh, uh, people that really brings a lot of value uh, to the startup community. And um, so today uh, we're going to have a really an open fireside. A fireside chat discussion with Bruce. Um, if you have any questions, please just go ahead and ask them in the uh, chat box that you have in front of you. Um, also, um, you know, again, we encourage you to do those as soon as possible uh, as we're going through the broadcast today. Uh, if there are questions that we don't get to, uh, you can always email me at pvinfo at pismoventures.com and I will forward any emails uh, to to Bruce as well. Um, we've been doing these uh, shows for about, uh, I don't know, a few months. And uh, it's we've, get, we've been getting a lot of great feedback. Um, uh, the most important thing we do is to help the ecosystem understand really what it takes to navigate the vibrant uh, community that, that we have uh, from uh, uh, thought leaders to investors to serial entrepreneurs that really brings a lot of value to answer many questions that uh, our listeners have, uh, including uh, what it takes to really be investable, what it takes to uh, really build, grow, and sell a business, because that's what everybody wants. Um, so uh, just a little bit about Pismo Ventures, uh, so we could uh, uh, tell you that we are a, a venture studio uh, with, with a um, and an accelerator uh, as well, we have a, a software development arm to really help our companies that need software development. We are uh, industry agnostic, but we do help businesses with whatever uh, startup needs they have. We do invest our resources, uh, including cash and uh, services, into our portfolio companies. We develop software as well if they need it. Uh, we facilitate funding. Uh, we open doors to make sure our portfolio companies are successful and also uh, we are building a fund um, and uh, we are a value-based hybrid cash and equity uh, star friendly model we also only engage with our uh, portfolio companies on a month-to-month -month basis no long-term contracts and we become a true business partner and an investor in each of our portfolio companies um, if you have not um, uh, uh, followed us or subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel, please do so now. If you have not subscribed to our um, social media, please, uh, or follow us on social media, please do so now as well. We would appreciate um, that. Um, so today, uh, Bruce is here. I'm going to let Bruce uh, introduce himself. Welcome, Bruce. Thank you for being here. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, JJ. You know, I've been watching this weekly for the past few months. I love it. it, it everybody is so right on. I can't even believe some of the guests you've had. Jim Pickell, David Friedman, Dave Berkus. How do you get Dave Berkus, right? Um, <laughs> Fred Haney, The Fundable Startup. I mean, I, it's one of the, my favorite books of the year. So that said, I'm happy to be here. And um, a little bit about myself is start from college, out of college. I thought I wanted to get into advertising, so I, I worked at Ted Bates Advertising. But I figured out pretty quick there was no money in that at all. So I wanted to make money. I became a stockbroker. I got my Series 7 in 63, went through the Merrill Lynch training program. And then I realized pretty quickly I don't really want to just cold call all day long and all night long and things like that. So I, I joined a managing general agency, a wholesale insurance agency. And two years later, I started my own MGA, where we built it in, into four states, 14 offices. I was always on a plane. And then I exited that, fortunately, after 10 years. 
And at the time, I thought I was just lucky. But really, looking back at that, I think that you know I really worked 16-hour days, and and I flew over two million miles just on American Airlines alone. So anyway, I, I took a break to play golf, which that didn't work out. And I was only 34 at the time, so I thought I would start a software company. So I was going to sell it into the insurance business because I saw this DOS-based insurance tool that to me seemed um, interesting and something um, that I put into Windows, which was back in, in the infancy back in those days. So as I was networking to find development talent for that software product, I met an engineer who had a mathematics tool that was getting some traction with scientists, engineers, tech writers for writing mathematical notation in scientific papers. So I thought I'd work with him on that for a bit and get some software experience. And then all of a sudden, boom, it's 20 years later, and I'm still at that company. We, we built a successful boutique software company. We licensed to Microsoft, to Apple, WordPerfect, if you remember them. I guess they're still around. In every document editor worldwide, and we sold a pro version of that called Math Type to with millions of users worldwide. I was fortunate enough to exit that in 2017, and the acquiring company kept me on as the CEO to move the entire operation from Southern California to Barcelona. So I did that for a year. And after that, I met Ron Hirsch. Ron Hirsch is the founder of Title Three Funds. He was looking for a CEO. He wanted to assemble a team to build and, squ and scale this equity crowdfunding company. The timing was good for me. I was looking for something interesting. So I studied the industry. I realized that this could be a unicorn. So I'm here. I assembled the team. And I, I think we're on our way. That's a little bit. <laughs> wow. What a story. That's that's a great background. So you decided after all this, you don't want to retire anymore. You can't play golf all day long, right? I can't even play golf. You know, I, I go with my son and he's he beats me. Yeah. Every time? <laughs> Every time. <laughs> there you go. Um, so that's why we do this, because we can't play golf all the time or go car racing all day long. It gets tiring, right? So, <laughs> Or flying, in my case, too. So... Uh, all right, so uh, this is, okay, so equity crowdfunding, um, it, it, a lot of people know of crowdfunding, not equity crowdfunding in general. So maybe let's start with that one so people understand the difference between the two, and then maybe we start getting into more uh, detailed or you know more pointed questions on equity crowdfunding. Maybe if you could explain the difference. I think a lot of people, when they hear crowdfunding, they think of Kickstarter, they think of GoFundMe, Indiegogo. I, I love telling the story of, of a company called Oculus Rift. They had virtual reality glasses. A few years yep. ago, they went on to Kickstarter. They raised two and a half million dollars from donations from over 9,000 people. If you donated $25, you got a t-shirt. If you donated $275, you got an unassembled prototype pack of virtual reality glasses. Well. 18 months later, Facebook bought Oculus Rift for $3 billion. Had this been equity crowdfunding, a $300 investment would have resulted in a $20,000 payout. So just imagine that. So with equity crowdfunding, instead of donating, you get shares in a company, you, you browse companies that sound good to you, maybe something you believe in, maybe a company with female founders, whatever. But the point is, if the company succeeds, you're invested and you get more than a t-shirt. Yep. Okay. So yeah, to make it very clear, because I, I get this question all the time. Um, so yeah, the, with a Kickstarter and others, you're you're getting a T-shirt, or you're just donating your money, or you're buying something way ahead of time for a discounted, right? So with the equity, you're actually getting equity into that business. So we're gonna uh, kind of deep dive into that. So what role does Title Three funds play in helping companies raise capital through the equity portion of crowdfunding? Well, once we find companies that are qualified to be on our platform, we walk them through the process every step of the way. We, we It's simple, but it's not easy. We, we partner with all of the best companies in the crowdfunding ecosystem. To start, we work with a law firm that helps the entrepreneur file their SEC paperwork, 
There's something called a Form C they have to file. Instead of paying their lawyer or another lawyer $10,000 or so to do this, we've negotiated with a partner to do this for $1,600. It's not really that hard to do. You know, when you're doing a lot of them uh, and we send them enough business that it makes it worth their while. Then there's the storytelling aspect of equity crowdfunding. And you need to make a video that needs to be produced. Entrepreneurs know how to tell the story about their company and their product, but with equity crowdfunding, part of the story is why an investor should invest in your company. So we've partnered with storytellers and video producers with equity crowdfunding experience. And then there's a digital marketing component of this where there's PR, there's escrow, there's cap table management, transfer agents, we spent the past two years vetting the best of the best in the industry. We negotiated lower prices for all of the companies that we work with. So our strength really is in the quality of the partners in our ecosystem and the fact that we want every single company that comes onto our platform to successfully raise the money that they need. And we handhold everybody just to make sure that they do succeed. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, so uh, what is, maybe you can explain a little bit your business model, and, and, and I don't, maybe I'll associate that with, uh, are there only also specific companies that you can help versus, uh, or maybe companies that you can better help than other companies? So start with the business model and maybe tell us a little bit about really what companies you could help most. So our business model is where we earn a success fee. There's no charge to come onto our platform. We don't charge investor fees. When a company has a successful raise, we earn 7% cash of the raise and 2% in securities based on the amount that they raise. So we take a stake in every company that succeeds in our platform. Our minimum raise is $100,000 per company per year. Other companies have you know, $10,000 minimums. Ours is 100,000. And right now our maximum is 1,070,000. Uh, the 1070000 is dictated by the SEC, and happily, the SEC just approved an increase from one million seventy to $5 million. The $5 million is a game changer for us, especially since the pandemic, because many VCs are refocusing. Some are holding dry powder for portfolio companies hit hard by the pandemic. So we're seeing a lot more inquiries and, and much better quality companies. Huh. So... Uh that's interesting. I, I always wondered why a million seventy. It just doesn't make any sense. But <laughs> it's a million seventy. Why is that? Do you know? I think it, it started out as, as safety measures. They wanted to protect investors. They wanted to see how it was going. It, it's a nascent industry. It started in 2016. You know, uh, Ron Hirsch, our founder, has been lobbying the SEC. Other uh, funding portals have been lobbying the SEC. It just did not make any sense. We were hoping for twenty million, but I think five million is still a, a great, a great way to go and game changer for us. Okay, uh, so you mentioned the SEC a few times, uh, so I bet this is quite regulated. Uh, maybe could you tell us about uh, the rules that are approved or regulated by the SEC? So the companies have to file a Form C, saying that they're going to what they're going to raise what the minimum raise is. We have to do uh, background checks on on founders. We have to do anti-fraud, things like that. So basically it's, it's just the filing with the SEC more so than, than uh, the founders being regulated, but we are regulated too. Every word on our website had to be vetted by FINRA and, and approved. So it's really a matter of protecting the investor and it, it's really all about making sure that they, they understand the risks involved in startup investing. Mm, okay. All right. Um, are, let's, let's talk about, uh, you know, what are the benefits for maybe the entrepreneurs? Uh, are, there, are there advantages? Are there disadvantages uh, for going through and getting the equity crowdfunding well, a big benefit for an entrepreneur is that they spend the same marketing dollar to acquire customers as they do to acquire investors. Investors are customers, customers are investors, customers and investors tell others about what they bought and what they invested in. And they, at the end of the day, the company gets funded and, and has a customer base all at the same time. 
Okay. Um, so on the investor side, uh, you and I talked about this, and uh, I've heard you talk about this before. Um, what is the investor's main benefit? Um, and potentially, I guess there's two types of investors. There is the crowdfunding investor who's putting $300 or $1,000 or $5,000. And there's potentially the uh, professional investors that are looking to put uh, potentially more money into it and maybe uh, potentially VCs if someone is trying to go to a Series A or a Series B. Um, so maybe you could tell us the benefits there. Well, so probably 10 to 20% of the investors that come into the platform are professional investors or accredited investors, depending upon the deal. The majority of investors are the general public, the everyday investor or a person who reads something about a company or a product that they want to get behind. They're certainly not doing the same diligence as, for instance, an angel investor, but they're typically investing a thousand dollars, something like that. We, we see millennials investing a thousand dollars in 25 different companies. Perhaps you've heard of the fire movement, financial independence, retire early. These are young investors who they don't want to wait until they're 50 or 60 to retire. They're trying to figure out how to make money now. Another yeah. significant investor for crowdfunded securities are people with self-directed IRAs. There are billions of dollars in self-directed IRAs because people are tired of playing the public markets. They want diversification. They go onto our website and or the, any number of custodian websites, and you'll see that they encourage their clients to look at crowdfunded securities as a way to diversify. It, crowdfunded securities is an opportunity for the everyday investor to get their foot in the door to invest in private companies. Until equity crowdfunding, the general public can only invest in stocks and bonds and mutual funds. And every time the market went down, they lost a giant chunk of their 401k or their IRA. Right. So equity crowdfunding, it democratizes startup investing. There's more than 200 million people in the United States alone who are now able to invest in private companies with equity crowdfunding. And you don't even have to be in the U.S. to invest. This is a global opportunity. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. So, uh, so just to answer the to ask you the question again around, what about does this in any way affect uh, the professional investors if they decided down the road they want to invest in a company that has been equity crowdfunded? Well, I, I think traditional investors had some valid issues with the original rules set up by the SEC. For instance, accredited investors, many of the people watching this probably today, they're only allowed to invest $100,000 per year in total in crowdfunded investments for the year. That's changed. The new SEC rules now have no limits on the amount that accredited investors can, can invest. Also, I think um, angels and professional investors had issues with, with 300 people being on a cap table. You know, that's a little bit messy, but the SEC's fixed that as well. They're now per permitting special purpose vehicles or SPVs. That's really good. See, I just learned something. No, I didn't. I knew I didn't know the SPVs are allowed now. So that's a great thing. All right. So we're getting already uh, a lot of questions from the audience. Let me bring some in. Um, so uh, this is from Terry. Terry said, is a raise capped at the goal amount or can it? get overfunded like traditional crowdfunding it's capped at at the 1 million 70 and then soon to be 5 million per year so next year you can come around okay and, yeah okay there you go um you cut out for a little bit but i think we got the answer um let's see next is uh from ron uh, so Ron says, is there legal baggage liability incurred by taking on accredited investors, non-accredited investors? Such as, I mean, you know, as far as we're concerned, we're, we're mostly a passive platform. We, we help the company through everything. We introduce them to all of the various partners. So they file their paperwork with the SEC. Anti-fraud is done to make sure that there, there's uh, know your customer and all of these things. So 
you know, specifically, I don't see any legal liability. No. Okay. Uh, I think what he may be asking, and I'm not sure, is uh, I think he's asking about uh, will will the accredited investors uh, end up being shying away because there are non-accredited investors because they're going to fear from non-accredited investors suing because they lost their money, their $100 or $1,000 or $5,000. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's been around since 2016 and there are zero lawsuits as far as I know of. Okay. All we right. That's, close. I'm sorry to say that one again. We, we watch it closely. You know, FC it, zero. Okay. Um, another question here from Robert. Uh, Robert says, please explain the criteria Title Funding 3 use it to determine qualification for Title 3 funding to engage. Basically, what is our vetting process, I imagine? Yeah, your vetting process and, yeah, you know, how, what, what, why would you engage a company versus not engage it? Well, we're, we're looking for an entrepreneur that has a company or product that can resonate, resi resonate, resonate with a crowd of investors, that they have a good chance of success. There are various platforms that will take anyone, and they have upfront fees and all that, and if some, something sticks, all the better. What we're looking for is a real company with real founders, founders that are coachable. The company also has to have the wherewithal to engage various partners and invest in investor acquisition. So it, it's not a matter of you just put them on our platform and investors will come. There has to be a, a marketing program that somebody has to pay for that the investor, pay, the, um, the entrepreneurs pay for. We won't put anyone on our platform unless we believe that 100% that they will succeed. I mentioned that we don't take any upfront fees. Everything's based upon a successful fundraising campaign and we take equity on the back end in, in hopes of working with a unicorn or two okay yeah um yeah it, it's it's uh, it's it's important that uh, you you explain that because like you said a lot of companies just take anybody for any reason um so uh, you and i talked about this before so i'll ask it now so when you and i talked it seemed like you're more um geared towards maybe consumer product type companies is that about right you know something that the crowd can something that the crowd can get their head around it's not just consumers so yes consumers for sure for instance we have a hydro diesel company coming on our site it, you know it, it's green it, it's a valuable company the, the founders are real is that a consumer product no but it's something that you can tell a story around you know we have a, a korean semiconductor company coming onto the platform. How do you tell a story about semiconductors? Well, we introduce them to storytellers that know how to tell a story about semiconductors. In fact, the company that's coming on the platform gets a dollar for dollar match from the South Korean government for everything that we help them raise. So that's actually a good deal for investors. And when you incorporate that into the story, you know, it, it just depends. It, it, something yeah. would be harder than others to, to tell a story around. So we try to help them figure that out. Okay. So now I'm getting a little bit of a theme. So as long as there is a way to tell a story and it is easy to some extent for the crowdfunding investor to understand it and willing to invest in it, that's probably kind of in general what you're looking for. Yeah, for sure. Okay. All right. I, I'm, I'm getting it. I'm getting it. I might be slow, but I'm almost there. <laughs> uh, all right. So this is a uh, another question from, oh, man, we're getting a lot of questions here. So uh, this is from Paul Stein. Um, With equity crowdfunding, one could have hundreds of investors. How difficult or interfering is it uh, working with that crowd when making strategic decisions? So there's no voting rights given. It, it's simply you're um, taking money, putting it in there. It's getting put into escrow. And when you meet your minimum funding, you're able to take the money out of escrow. 
and everybody gets shares. We only offer equity or convertible notes on our platform. We don't do safes. We don't do anything esoteric like that, but it's, it's just a fair deal. You get the proportional amount you invest in, in convertible notes or shares of the company. So I'm going to guess that's a really good question and a good answer. I'm guessing this would be common shares, non-voting. Correct. Very good. That's awesome. Um, all right. So this is from the Black Channel. Uh, does equity crowdfunding require us to service the usual notification requirements to 120,543 $2 investors, $2 per investor? I'm not sure what that means. Uh, you don't know either. That means all right. So could you could you clarify that? I'm not sure what that means. The black channel. Next time, please put real names so we know what this, how to call you. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Teresa, um, uh, can you please answer Ron's and Terry's question? I think we we did. We've been answering questions uh, down. Uh, down the line. All right, let's see. We have a, a question from Mark Bragg. So he he says, we are a startup on the first phase of an $80 million project. The founders have invested $1 million. Our first outside round is 500000 Are we suitable for crowdfunding? Uh, they're a USA renewable um, energy company. You could be. Let, let, talk to me after this. Okay. Here, what you have. If you have a, a deck to send me, I'll take a look at the deck. I'll share it with my team. You, you basically have to have a, a good story to tell. You have to have a real company that's really in business. You have to have enough marketing dollars in order to acquire investors. You should have some um, investors, lead investors to come in as soon as the campaign goes live to show traction, things like that. So if you have anything like that, Reach out. I'd love to talk to you. All right. There you go. Um, uh, Jay Stone, uh, what are the reporting requirements to investors? Keep in touch with the investors on a regular basis, just like any other investors. So are you requiring or does the SEC require um, for so but after uh, or after they get funded, uh, they do whatever they are supposed to do? After they get funded, they're they're supposed to just keep in touch. We want our entrepreneurs to keep in touch with our investors to keep the investors happy. You know, th this is a three five year liquidity event. So, in the meantime, what does an investor have except knowledge about what's going on in the company? So, we just ask that entrepreneurs keep in touch with the investors to to keep them happy and let them know what's going on. So there is no requirement on your side or on equity find, uh, crowdfunding side for that purpose. It's more of what's um, customary. Yeah, it's not a legal requirement. I think it's just a good practice. Okay. All right. Um, uh, this is from Wilson. Wilson says, how are you different from Start Engine and WeFunder? So Start Engine and WeFunder offer more than just what we offer. We we offer something called regulation crowdfunding where right now we can take companies looking to raise 1 million 70 and that amount is raising up to 5 million very soon. Those other companies have uh, Reg A, Reg D, they do all kinds of deals. They do safe notes. And we think the problem with that is that they confuse the, the general public investor, the everyday investor, they'll go on to one of those sites and they'll see 75 deals. And they, as an investor, don't really know the difference between regulation crowdfunding, uh, Reg A crowdfunding. They you know, so they're confused and we're, we're trying to give them more of a fair shake. We're also not just onboarding anybody. As I mentioned before, if you go onto those platforms, you'll see some people are raising $40,000 and you can invest $10 in those companies. What we're trying to do is find real companies and $100,000 minimum fundraise and, and make it a good, fair deal for both the investors and for the entrepreneurs. 
Okay, uh, related question from uh, uh, Blue Coast Ventures. How do you differ from Republic, Seed Invest, Net Capital? You know, we're all in the same exact category of equity crowdfunding. And we are the only company that does regulation crowdfunding exclusively. Everybody else, like I mentioned, does uh, reg, reg A, Reg D, and offer a, a variety of esoteric investment vehicles and things like that. We just stick with, make it simple, regulation crowdfunding only, equity, convertible notes. That's it. Yep. Okay. Um, Ross says, what is a typical investment amount? I would say accredited investors, 10,000, and non-accredited investors, average 1,000. Okay. Um, do you work, this from Wilson, do you also work with pre-revenue companies? Sure. I, I, pre-revenue companies have if something going on that, that seems like it's, yeah, we, we work with pre-revenue companies. So pre-revenue, post-revenue, it doesn't matter as long as they're they're doing it within the regulations and um, and and uh, you know they have the right story to be able to not confuse the uh, the potential uh, crowdfunding investor. Right. Um, okay. Shai says, "Is your two percent equity non-dilutive?" No, it, it's dilutable. But okay, so <laughs> you're you're in the same boat like everybody else, right? Sure. Yeah. And it's by the way, it, it, the two percent equity is two percent of the amount raised. It's not two percent of equity in the entire company. So it's just something to let people know. That's very uh, yeah. I'm glad you clarified that. So, all right. Um, now the question regarding pre revenue: Does the funding work? Okay, so that is we answered that one. <laughs> um, okay, here's another one from Michael. Uh, what is the average marketing investment required to be successful on your platform? It's a great question. So we, we introduce you to digital marketing agencies. These are people who have experience doing crowdfunding campaigns, hundreds of successful crowdfunding campaigns. They say that it, it's somewhere between 5 and 20% of the amount you want to raise gets spent in marketing dollars to acquire investors. That amount ranges depending upon what you already have going on. If you already have social proof, you have 20,000 Facebook followers or something to that, you're, you're far ahead. You, you're not going to need to spend 20% of it. You, you'll, you're closer down to the 5% range or even less. It just, it just depends on your specific situation. But what really happens is you file your paperwork with the SEC, we introduce you to these specialized marketing agencies and, and they come up with a marketing plan specific for you and you execute on that plan. And it has to do with social media outreach. It has to do with Facebook advertising. It has to do with mailing to your lists and they have their special sauce, things that marketing agencies do well. And, and so it, it's not, it's not inexpensive, but it works. All right. So there's another question. You just answered that one too. Um, uh, someone's asking for your email. Do you want to give it uh, here, or do you like to? Uh, I'll I'll make introductions to the individuals that want to connect with you. Sure. It's B like boy Virga B like vacation I R G A at title 3 funds.com all right so you could see bruce's name on the on the uh, on the screen so it's his first initial last name at title 3 funds.com yeah connect with me on linkedin as well all right very good follow us all on right uh, i'm sorry say that again follow us on social as well we, we post a lot of social oh there you go there you go um uh, so this this is related to the marketing. Do you have a marketing package available? I don't, I don't think there's such a thing as a marketing package. What we have is are marketing companies that we'll introduce you to. Totally uh, professional. They they understand equity crowdfunding and how it works and, and how to succeed. So they'll 
the, what the range of things they do, for instance, would be to reach out on your behalf on LinkedIn to potential investors, advertise on Facebook and, and Google, uh, mail, mailing to your lists, just managing the entire campaign for you. So they, they're doing all the work for you. Okay. Um, this is from Ron Cohen again, uh, of the various services involved in the, in the raise, legal advertising, etc., which are uh, paid for by Title Three, and which must be paid uh, by the venture company itself. So the entrepreneur, the venture company, they pay for everything. We're we're the passive platform. Our teams negotiated everything. So like I mentioned earlier, instead of paying a lawyer $10,000 to help you file your SEC paperwork, we've made a deal with a company called LawCloud where they do it for $1,600. So you're, you're paying for it, but we've set everything up for you with all of the various partners for them and we've negotiated deals for you. Uh, Paul Stein asked a question, uh, I think you answered it to some extent. Uh, does it does it become difficult for a large medical a device company hiring a crowdfunded company with so many st stock owners? Well, with a sp special purpose vehicle, that solves the problem of having yep. a messy cap table with the 300 or so people on there. So so you're able to create that as well, right? Right. As part of what you're doing. That's perfect. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Uh, this is from a long name with cabinets of Orange County. So signing up on your site is free, but how much do professionals uh, cost that help you go to the market, take equity, uh, to a pay cash up front? So All it's right. a multi, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, it, it's free to come on our platform. We don't charge. A listing fee, for instance, some some companies do. We don't charge investors to invest or any kind of investor fee. But what happens is we make money on the success. If you're if you successfully raise, say, a million dollars, we make seventy. I wish we we make seven percent in cash and we make two percent in securities. All of the other companies, for instance, filing your paperwork with the SEC, they locked out, they make $1,600 from you. Uh, if you need a video made, we have somebody that can help you tell a story. They can also produce the video. If you need a pitch deck done, there are resources for pitch decks that if you can't do it yourself, somebody's going to have to get paid to help you with your pitch deck. When you open up an escrow account, there's escrow that has to be set up and paid for. And then there's various fees that the escrow company charges at, in the end. So in, in the end, there are fees, but you're still able to raise a heck of a lot of money. Right. So, uh, yeah, so th there are there are fees associated with, um, with, with doing this. And so people need to be aware ahead of time and, and be prepared for that um, so that there's no really surprises. Um, there's no surprises. We'll we'll walk everybody through the process. We everything is completely transparent. Okay. Um, so this is uh, this is really related to that. Uh, I, I don't know if we answered that one. Yeah, no, we did answer that one already. Okay. So back to um, another question here. This is from Manny. And he says, on average, what is the percent spent out of the raised amount to cover the expenses, including your commission? I think you addressed that a little bit already. Yeah. I don't know what, what the average would be, but like I said, 7% success fee in cash, 2% in securities for us, $1,600 to file paperwork with the SEC. Uh, marketing fees range, depends upon type of company that you have and what you already have going on as far as um, social media and mailing lists, the more you have, the less it's going to cost in, in marketing expense. So 
All right, so this is kind of related to that from uh, from Eric. Eric says, uh, how much does having thousands and thousands of social media followers and pre-registering influencers to gain access to millions of IG followers and bringing on uh, two senior marketing manager of sweat help? So he's got a lot of followers, a lot of social media, a lot of influencers. That should really help with the crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding, is that, is that, that correct? That's really what it is all about. It, it's, it's a matter of having people that are believing in your company, following your company, that they, you just have to tell them that now, instead of just the product, you can invest in our company. So you're, you're most of the way there if you have that kind of following. All right, this may be a little bit outside of the question or the discussion here. Um, you know, we can explain it later maybe, but can you describe the framework of an SPV and how it's documented? What should, what would follow on traditional investors be seeing in the way of SPV documentation? Well, I, I should mention that the SPV is one of the new SEC rules that are coming into, into effect. So it's not law yet. It, it's going to be very soon. It was, they, they proposed everything in March of this year and in May, they approved everything and now it's all being written into law. So I don't really have a solid answer for that, but okay. it's imminent. Okay. Um, uh, from Wilson, uh, is it possible or legal to be listed on multiple platforms? It is, sure, you could do that. You could even do side-by-side -side types of, of raises. We do regulation crowdfunding or, or Reg CF. You could do a Reg D on one platform a reg cf on our platform a reg a on another platform <laughs> yeah there you go good question uh wilson again he says uh, how many companies have you worked with and what has been the success rate we are launching this month with three companies we have built a pipeline for the rest of the year of companies and we actually vetted over 1,600 companies over the past two years. So we're a startup ourselves, and we're we're about to go. We have a superb team, and I think we have it all going on. All right, that's good. Um, okay, uh, so uh, I'm going to ask you some questions that you know um, maybe a little bit different than than the questions being asked. So what is what is the makeup um, uh, of, of or, or what constitutes a typical uh, investor from the crowdfunding standpoint? Are they blue collar? Are they white collar? Are they gray collar? Are they someone who's in their 80s and they got a little bit of money? What, what's, what's the typical investor? Well, I, I was trying to say this earlier. We, you know, ten percent or so, twenty percent perhaps, are professional investors, angel investors, people who know what they're what they're doing and, and how to vet deals. Then, you know, the vast majority is the general public, and you know, a lot of it has to do with are they going to invest in your product? And it really has to do with how you appeal uh, to that everyday general public person investor. So I don't I don't necessarily think it's, it's blue collar, white collar. I, I think it's just people who are tired of losing money in, in a volatile public market all the time. And now they're home with coronavirus going on and they have a lot of time in front of their screens looking at deals. And, you know, that's that's the investor is just the everyday person, somebody that wants to spend a thousand dollars on something they really believe in. Well, that's, I think this is the whole point of, of equity crowdfunding is open it up to the to anybody. Um, and so that's uh, so anyone with a few hundred dollars or a thousand dollars can put their money and invest into a company that they believe in. And, and going back to what you keep saying, and that is there's got to be a real story around it that appeals to the general public it's easy for them to understand so that really i think uh, makes a lot of sense um uh from you know, a business by the way Jim, yeah so in, in 2016 
the general public could not invest in private companies, right? Yep. So yep. in 2016, when this became legal, that opened it up to 200 million people in the United States that now can invest in private companies. And it's not just limited to the United States. So this is an opportunity for private companies to use the crowd to, to fund their companies. Everybody's looking for the next unicorn. Everybody wishes they could have gotten their foot in the door with Uber and every other company you could possibly name. And yeah. this is perhaps that opportunity. That's the dream. That's that's what we're here doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So from, from a business perspective, uh, can we discuss the process? What does a company need? to have in place before they can launch a crowdfunding campaign and, and what's involved. So, so this is maybe a little bit more detailed than we, what we've touched upon, but do they have to things, they need to have things done up front uh, before they come to you or what is it? <laughs> well, for our platform, they have to go through our vetting process. And I, as I mentioned, most platforms don't really have much of a vetting process. It's really a, a passive platform where anybody can go on, but if you just go on, you're not gonna be successful. So as I was mentioning, uh, we help entrepreneurs through the entire process. I think that's really our strength is the fact that we know the process, we help them through the entire process. We introduce them to um, a company that'll help them file their SEC paperwork. So the first step is to file something called the Form C with the SEC. Much of the information in the Form C is what we use to create the content of that company's page on our funding portal. So nothing really starts until you file your, your paperwork with the SEC. From there, we do the anti-fraud and the bad actor checks, and the company starts an escrow account. Uh, a, a crowdfunding video gets produced. The video is about selling securities as much as it is about selling a company or selling, a, talking about the company or the product. As I mentioned, there's an art to creating an equity crowdfunding video, and it really does start with the storytelling, as we've been saying. We're, we've aligned ourselves with the top creative talent, and they specialize in equity crowdfunding videos. We introduce entrepreneurs to specialized marketing companies to get social media channels turned on and to prepare a marketing strategy based on the uniqueness of the company. Once everything's in place, we turn on the campaign. And, and once you've reached your $100,000 minimum, um, you have to wait 21 days to be able to take that money out of escrow. And after that, you could do a rolling close once you reach the $100,000 after 21 days. So you can continue to take money out of escrow, use it for building your company right there, use it for reinvesting in marketing. And, and companies can raise up to $5 million every year. All right. Um Bruce, uh, this is a really good question. This is from um, Michael. Uh, do foreign crowdfunding investors require special documentation versus US-based investors? Uh, for companies that permit, for companies, for countries that permit investing in the United States, they don't require anything special whatsoever. So you, basically it's open internationally to for every international investor to invest in US companies. We, you know, we're limited to the companies being US-based companies. They, we can't have foreign companies on our funding portal. We can only raise for US companies, but investors can be worldwide. Okay, so the companies must be US, but the investors can come from anywhere. Right. All right, um, this is from Ross. Uh, what is the maximum raise allowed by SEC for ECF? I don't know what ECF is. Equity crowdfunding, uh, I would, I, so. I guess, <laughs> okay. So for our kind of equity crowdfunding, which is called regulation crowdfunding or Reg CF, Title Three of the Jobs Act from 2016, it started out as 1 million, it got adjusted for inflation to 1 million 70. Uh, we've been lobbying the SEC for a higher limit. We were hoping for a $20 million limit and we got a $5 million limit. So right now the limit is 1 million 70, but imminently going to be $5 million per year per company. Yeah. 
Yeah, you did answer that one. I just didn't know what ECF is. I thought it was some other acronym. <laughs> I guess that's like pretty crowded. Yeah. <laughs> How are shares priced to investors? It, it's based upon the amount. Um, it's, it's basically up to the company to uh, figure that out, to say what they want the minimum to be, what, what the uh, minimum raise is going to be, and what the minimum amount invested in each is going to be. So it, it's it's basically up to the entrepreneurial company that's doing this. We don't set. Uh, that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we're trying, you know, back to the investors. So we're trying to get the investors to like understand um, the company. So based on what you're saying, it seems that those investors that want to invest in this because now it's open to the crowds, they want to do it because they're tired of losing money in the stock market and maybe they have a better opportunity of uh, maybe making some money, although it's highly risky, but potentially they could throw a thousand dollars here, it turns 10 times, they make 10 grand, it's not a lot of risk. Is that kind of the idea behind it? That's kind of the idea. It, it depends on how much money you have, but Basically, think about it. instead of putting fifty thousand dollars into into one company, you could put in a thousand dollars into fifty different companies. And hopefully, if you you're doing some homework on it, it's something that you believe in. Three five years or you know whatever, there's some sort of liquidity event. You've made money, and maybe three of those companies will will succeed. You know, just it's, it's like a smaller version of being a VC or an angel investor. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so th this is my last question to you. I, I think we've asked it a couple of times in different ways, but uh, uh, traditional investors uh, have been at times apprehensive, right, about these types of equity crowdfunding. It seems that uh, a lot uh, of the early concerns and fears that may have been placed uh, in equity crowdfunding are are kind of kind of going away, right? Because because especially with the SPV you talked about, and maybe maybe uh, and so there's there are and and these these uh, concerns have been way to active interest by investor groups. Why do you think that is? Well, for starters, traditional investors, they are doing their best to put their money behind winners. They, they put a huge effort into vetting, and they still don't get it right all of the time. Crowdfunding is dependent upon a philosophy called wisdom of the crowd. It kind of goes against the norm for a traditional investor. Although, if you, if you think about it, some investors that are professional investors will only invest through a fund. So that's maybe a different version of crowdfunding in a way. Just with a different vetting philosophy. I think traditional investors also had some valid issues with, with the original rules set up by the SEC. Like I mentioned earlier, accredited investors could only invest $100,000. Bill Gates could only invest $100,000 a year in crowdfunded investments. Well, that's changed. Now there's no limits on the amount that accredited investors will be able to invest. And messy cap tables. I've heard that a lot. And SEC fixed that by permitting special purpose vehicles. So I, I think it's, it's sort of, it's becoming now an alternative to uh, to VC money, to angel investors, and everybody's looking at equity crowdfunding. I think it's it's a nascent industry and it's, it's really starting to take off. All right, that's, that's really good. Uh, uh, and it clarifies things much better. So this is, Harry, he says, do you recommend any storytelling firm to, or should they go through you? Go through me. It's not me. It, it's I recommend them to you. We, we, my, my team is well connected. We know everybody in this space. As far as how to tell your story, yes, I'll introduce you to somebody to tell your story. You'll work with them. If you, if you like them, you pay them and they'll help you produce a video unless you have somebody else that'll help you produce a video. So everything everything from everything you need to know about equity crowdfunding 
our team knows it all and we walk you through every step of the process including introducing you to talented creative people with experience in this in this business all right um this is from mike bauer uh does it help to provide other investor incentives beyond ownership discounts or product purchasing <laughs> yeah definitely you can give t-shirts <laughs> um but yeah you can still give t-shirts <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for sure, I, I think it just depends upon what the, what the product is and, and how you say it. And I think these incentives do work as well. Lot, lots of companies do incentives for sure. Okay. Um, uh, what type? Uh, this is from uh, Wilson. What type of financials are you looking for from companies? Well, so we have pre-revenue. I'm looking at pro forma financials, and I have to sort of believe in that. And real financials for companies that have revenue, we we look at it. Uh, we're you know we're not just um, an equity crowdfunding company. We have financial people that understand valuation, that understand financials, and so I, I think we're looking for solid companies, companies that have potential for our investors and, you know, show me your financials. I, you know, it's hard to say anything specific as, as to what I'm looking for, but when I, I see it and it's good, I'll know it. Um, I think we answered this question from Leslie, but I think maybe we need to make it clear um, what type of companies at, and what stage are best. This would be the last question uh, to, you know, for this type of um, funding. So I think we answered it a couple of times, but I think that would be good to clarify again, Bruce. I, I think seed companies are good. Series A is good, $5 million. So, so companies that are pre-seed, that's what we have been getting because of the, the $1 million limit. But now that um, the pandemic has hit and now that the $5 million limit is in place. We're we're seeing a lot better quality companies, seed rounds, Series A rounds, and and frankly, that's mostly what we're looking for. Okay, and the type of companies for her again? Yeah, so the type of companies would be something where you can really tell a good story, something that's solid, somebody that founders or have maybe done it before. If they haven't done it before, what's what's the product like, and how far along are you? You know, like I said, we've we've talked to a lot of companies, and you, you kind of know off the bat whether you think this could this could work or not. So when I see it, I'll write to me, and I'll uh, if I see it, I'll, I'll let you know what I think. There you go. All right. So uh, before we're almost about three minutes away from uh, from the end of our show today. Um, so I'm going to do some closing, but uh, maybe while I'm doing that, if you could think of maybe one advice that you can give uh, the listeners from the standpoint of what's maybe what's the best way uh, to, you know, engage uh, a firm like yours or Title III funding in order to, um, in order to raise uh, capital through equity crowdfunding. Uh, what 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 should they do in order to be successful at that? And I'll be right back. You can think about that while I'm uh, doing some of the closing. So um, everyone, thank you for being here today. I wanted to thank everybody for joining us. Um, I, I learned a lot today. I hope you did as well. Uh, I really appreciate uh, Bruce's time and explaining to us what crowdfunding, uh, equity crowdfunding is. Uh, if you have not... Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Again, please do so. Uh, if there is any uh, question that uh, we could still answer, you can always send it to pvinfo at Pismo Ventures, and I will forward it to uh, Bruce. Also, uh, this recording will be available by tomorrow morning, so if you want to listen to this again or forward it to your friends, uh, please do so. Um, also, follow us on social media. Um, we have a great lineup coming up in the next few weeks. Um, uh, we have Zandra from OC Angels. Uh, she's coming up next week. Scott Fox the week after. John Harbison, the uh, Chairman Emeritus for Tecos Angels. We have uh, Jay Cromier and Life Science Angels coming on 
uh, August 17th. And we have Barbara Russell from um, uh, Cap W uh, uh, Investment Group uh, out of Boston. And then we have uh, Kathy Preby and Roland Showman from uh, Sierra Angels uh, out of Nevada. So a uh, really great lineup between now and the end of the year. Um, also, I want to mention to all of you that Pismo Ventures is um, running a venture plan competition. This is a national business plan competition. We will announce it tomorrow. So if you follow us on social media or on uh, or on uh, uh, LinkedIn or, or on uh, Eventbrite, uh, every one of you will receive a uh, uh, an email or notification. So it's a national venture plan competition, which allows you not to only win maybe some pri some prizes, but also the winners will be given the opportunity to pitch to 30 different angel groups and VCs across the nation. Uh, this is a huge opportunity for anyone to really become part of this uh, business plan competition. Uh, it's going to launch on the 22nd uh, for open applications. After that, um, the actual competition will be will start on September 7th. Uh, we have hundreds of investors that will be part of this, including, as of today, third groups and VCs and family offices that listen and help um, the entrepreneurs that win to raise capital. All right, Bruce, thank you for being here. Tell us what your advice is. I say build up social media, have a good company, be coachable, get in touch. JJ, there you go. Thank you so much, JJ. That's really good. I'm, I'm really happy we connected so much today, uh, much more than I knew about funding and I hope the audience did as well. Uh, Bruce, thank you very much. We're staying safe. I have this in January, so there you go. <laughs> All right. Hope to see you soon. All right. Same here. All right. Thank you everyone for oh, listening. Well. Stay tuned. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.